Hello there and welcome to my little arty corner here on YouTube. I'm Angela, Angela Porter, and it's lovely to have you join me for almost probably about an hour of art today and a bit of waffle to begin with. Thank you so much for all the lovely comments. I'm going to do my best to stay awake or alert long enough to answer them today. Yeah, it's been a week again and today I am just exhausted. I'm feeling flat and I just need to do some pretty art and that's all I've been in the mood for for a while but I always am but more so familiar things I think or, and, but in some ways things that also push my boundaries a bit. I've got I've actually got a mug of coffee here this is coffee this is how weak I like coffee um, enough to taste and it's really lovely I think this is um, this is the Machu Picchu um, instant coffee from Ca Cafe Direct and it smells absolutely wonderful in the tin. It's I ca I'm not sure if it's that one or the other one is what's my no this is Mayan gold I think. One of them smells so chocolatey and there's nothing other than coffee in there. It's they're just beautiful and I think I found my favourite the coffee I like. So I like, um, I, I do love my tea, but at the moment tea tastes wrong and I don't know why it's tasting wrong to me. But anyway, so no further ado, let me show you some art and I'll, I'll explain as I draw and so on. Um, this is something I did a few days ago, started to add colour to. Um, a friend of mine suggested that I should use these um, colours of sort of like blue and red and gold and yellow, very reminiscent of medieval manuscripts, but of course done in an Angela way. I did start adding colour using coloured pencils, but I really was not happy with the intensity of colour. And so I went, I swapped over to ink tents and I can't tell where the coloured pencils are and where the ink tents are. Um, perhaps it's because I chose colours from, both from Derwent, um, but series I used Derwent's ink tents and Derwent's chroma flow so some of the colours must be so similar even though they've got different names that they actually work well together. Um, I'm quite I wasn't sure about this I'm still not sure about these colours but I can finish this and I completely forgot to scan this in before I started adding colour but I think I work on the theory that if I want to do it again it's not a problem I could also remove the colour digitally, I'm not sure I want to do that, but these are also kinds of experimentations for finding patterns or shapes or combinations of line shapes and things that I enjoy drawing that I can make use of another time. These here particularly, I love this section and some of these that seem to have bobbly bits on them and, and so on and I, I love the, the, the way my hand moves is almost joyful. I, ca I can't describe it. It's, it gives me pleasure to draw swooping lines and curly lines and I've just really enjoyed that. I will finish adding colour to this but I had a need to try others and this one, these are colours where I'm going, oh what was I thinking? That bright green <laughs> with a bright purple, talk about complementary colours almost, bouncing off each other. Um, I can tone the green down if I wish, but I know I need to do more. And I've got a sneaky, well, I've started to add gold in as well to break it up a bit, golden colours. Um, but no problem. And again, it's more of an experiment here and seeing how things work and just trying things out and seeing what appears. And again, it's something I may use for further inspiration. I say if I finish adding colour, I may never finish adding colour. These may end up in a sketchbook as something to draw inspiration from. And it's almost like I want to use little viewfinders here to isolate little sections and use those to draw from. And I could do that digitally, but it doesn't work the same for me. Isn't it strange? I look at things on the screen and they look different to how they look in front of me. Um, and it's, it's all to do with scale and, and perception of scale. And this is something I struggle with um, when it comes to working on paper and working on my screen, you know, working digitally. Um, I lose my sense of perspective and, and how big things really are. So when I draw colouring pages, I have to draw them at the size they're going to be reproduced. Sometimes I draw them smaller so that I don't cram in so much detail, so that when I ink them in, 
I expand the size and I've got plenty of open space. Some does get filled it as bits added to it, but it stops me from becoming like this. Although there are people who love colouring pages like this, I have to say. Okay, so that's another one. So this was one that I started adding colour to this morning while I was trying to come round. Very muted tones, very vintage tones. Now this I like. This is me. And I am, I am doing something that I haven't done before. And I don't understand why I haven't done it before. I am keeping a record of the blends I'm using or blends I could use with the colour palettes I've chosen um, to help me both here and now remember how I got a particular colour blend but also for future reference and I just have enjoyed doing this. I certainly haven't done all of the possible colour combinations out of, I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven colours for this one. Um, but I really, really do like this very vintagey, almost steampunky kind of feeling. And I also quite like the uneven nature of the colour in all of them. There's something about this that I'm beginning to embrace and understanding that if I want perfect blending, I do it digitally. If I use traditional media, I get something that's more unpredictable. I know there are people who can work with traditional media in a predictable way. I certainly, well, I, I don't think I can. Um, and certainly water soluble media like this really do vex me. But I just love that color combination. And I've got a couple more here. This one is, I used a thicker pen. All, all of these I've drawn with my Twisby fountain pens. The, the, the ones that are quite, have got thinner lines, it's an extra fine or a fine point. This I think is a medium. And the thicker the line, the bigger I draw. That's how I make sure I don't get too teeny tiny. This one would make a lovely colouring page. Um, this one may be just a bit on the busy side for that. But um, I, I'm not quite sure. This one is, this one's lovely. That one might be this week's colouring page. I'm a bit late to getting the colouring page out. Um, I'm a bit late with everything at the moment. But this one has got these broken or wiggly edges, almost like the edges of cliffs or stones, you know, sort of like a rock layers you'd see. And um, that's unusual for me to put such erratically shaped lines in, but I actually quite like it. Oh, I've got to put a little, little one in there. I've got a little gap there where I could have put that in. Don't know, quite know how I'm going to do, what I'm going to do with that. But again, it's both finished, but it's also an, a piece for inspiration where, I, again, I can use that viewfinder or I can isolate parts, add patterns that I haven't come across before that have, I've created spontaneously here. Feeling overwhelmed by the size of the artwork? I can get overwhelmed by that as well. So a couple of days ago, I thought I'd do a bookmark. I haven't finished it, obviously. I haven't added all the colour, but this took about an hour to draw, um, which is far more manageable. And the size of this paper, the other sheets you've seen are A4 in size, which is um, nearly 30 centimetres by 21 centimetres. I don't know what that is in inches, but it's a bit shorter and a bit wider than letter size in America. This one is, it's about six and a half centimetres by 21 centimetres, which equates to I can get my see which way around my ruler is a little bit more than eight inches um which is 21 centimeters so my little ruler here is only 20 and a bit centimeters long okay so what I've done for today is I'll keep bookmarks for another day but I'm going to try and draw bigger <laughs> but I've got a piece of paper here Oh, and the, all the paper is Canson Imagine mixed media paper. It's relatively inexpensive I and mean, you can get cheaper papers for sure, but it actually is quite, it's quite thick. And the way that water soluble media work on it suits me. I never seem to do well with watercolor paper. 
um, the all media paper I've got in my sketchbooks by C White. That's quite nice to use, but it it tends to stick to the paper more than it. But the ink tent sticks to the paper more with that than it does with this. So yeah. So these are twenty one centimeters in its longest direction and a little just a tad less than 10 centimeters wide as I cut one sheet up into three sections all about the same so again a little bit over eight inches high have I got that parallel hang on a mo do that parallel no it's a bit off huh. typical where's my where did I put my pencil I had, a, I had a pencil here. Oh, there it is. It's hiding. I was just thinking that's a bit wonky. I'm going to make it even wonkier, most probably now. Perhaps I won't, actually. Perhaps it is. Oh, it is right. It's close enough. And I tend to go outside. It just doesn't look right, perhaps because I haven't got my glasses on yet. And this pencil border I've drawn around. I've used this ruler and it's about um, one, two, three eighths of an inch wide or about a centimetre all around and it's just a guide. Now then, I could use a Twisby and I'm tempted to because I do love my Twisby pens and I think I will and I will find my piece of paper. Whether we get any colouring done today, I don't know, but let's make a start. I'll try and remember about 11 minutes in, I'm going to start drawing, so I, I'll put some things in the description so you can skip ahead and a note at the beginning. I'll try and remember to put a little note in as I blurb along. Okay, so how do I draw this kind of abstract drawing? I just pick a place to start. And we all have I think we all have lines and forms and shapes that just make us happy or we find pleasure in drawing them. And so for me it's often swirls and shapes like this, very organic kind of forms. I do use sort of like geometric patterns, you know, with straight line, straightish lines and things, because I, I draw everything by hand, so they're all always a bit imperfect. And I'm I prefer that to something that's done with perfection. That, that's the expression of me. But um I just know, I just let my hand move in the way it wants to for it to be quite happy. Now I've got no idea whether I make a conscious decision about the shape I'm going to draw or whether it just flows. Um, I just felt I needed to put some little blocks here. Perhaps if I zoom in, hopefully you'll be able to see a bit better. And I made these quite, you know, sort of like tall and thin so that I can get a, an interesting shape here. That was a conscious decision because I thought, oh, okay. But I'm not overthinking things. I'm not sitting here pondering very much or thinking, oh, what pattern would I like to use today? Sometimes it's nice to have a list of patterns or a limited number of patterns to use and to create using them. Sometimes I like to sit with a, a pattern or a frag, fragment in Zen tangle terms, you know, sort of like a, a basic unit of a repeating pattern and just come up with variations on the theme and see where it leads me. And then I have a whole stash of these possibilities that I could use or not. Because they're there in a book for reference as a store. And I can refer to them if I need that kind of inspiration. Like with colours, it's nice. I find it much easier to use a limited colour palette, a limited number of colours, than I do having the whole possibility of colours that you have in a large collection of coloured pencils or markers or watercolours or digital colours. You have an infinite number there, I tell you. And um, and I can get overwhelmed by a large number of colours and I think my favourite work I've done has been where I've used a fairly limited palette. In fact, as I look in my room here, 
I've done three, just three oil paintings in the whole of my existence. I really dislike oil paints. And I just, oh, were these oil? No, these were acrylic, I think. They might have been. No, they were either oil or acrylic or mixing them, not mixing them. But, you know, some might be oil, some might be acrylic. And two of them are done with a palette of, of a golden yellow, a lovely warm orange, a deeper orangey red and a kind of rich magenta, rich deep magenta and a deeper version of that magenta. And the other one is done with whites and blues to a very dark blue. And just those limited colours makes me quite smile and feel happy about them. Because um, they were patterns that I extracted from some drawings I did of uh, Romanesque sculpture and things to do with steam locomotives, bits and parts of steam and diesel locomotives, rusty bits. And then I had no intention of trying to replicate the colours that they were there really. I used colours that went with how I felt with them. So the the locomotives, it was the, the reds and oranges and yellows, that fieriness, the power, the you know, the combustion engine and the excitement and the passion there. But with the Romanesque sculpture, there's the lovely cool blues for the peace and calm and relaxation and tranquility and the ability to sit and meditate as I draw. And there's a story about colours when I choose them like that. It's like today, the steampunky colours are, um, are, I think, more of a, those more muted vintagey colours are, are more of a symptom of how I'm feeling today and what I would like to do in terms of colour and what I need rather than perhaps what I would make as a choice of colour on another day. Though I have to say that I do tend towards these more muted, more vintagey colours and I'm so glad in some ways now that I'm actually exploring these colours with traditional media and how to make how to record the gradient colours and the colour mixes that I like and being brave enough to do that. Um, and I also know that I could scan that sheet in and use that then to colour pick for digital colour palettes as well. Because um, some of the colours are just, well, they just do it for me. It's really interesting how over life, the choice of colours, the colours that you prefer tends to or can change. We still have a love for purples and pinks and teals and lovely sea blues, deep sea blues. But, um, but I'm finding I really love burnt oranges now as well. And that's a bit of a surprise. Because an orange has never been a favourite colour of mine. And yet I find myself veering towards it from time to time, which is rather delightful in its way. I don't know whether it's maturity or just experience or just a better understanding of myself or just growth and development, you know, as we do. I still like really bright colour colours for certain kinds of art. I do the more whimsical and doodle creatured kind of worlds. They they need that kind of colour. Because, you know, it's fun. So um, there are times where I really like using that limited colour palette. So you can see that this is how I've always sat and drawn things. And I do tend to like work that is quite abstract, but draws on the elements of nature and things I've observed. And as, say, as I've already said, there tends to be a, a quite a big organic feel to it as well. I do use the terms from the Zentangle method to describe things because I struggle to find my own words to describe what I'm doing here. It's kind of repeating shapes, layering them, stacking them um, to create that pattern or a rhythm or a texture, pattern. I'm just putting things together in a way that just seems to work for me, just seems to please me for 
some reason or another. It doesn't really have to be any reason at all. I say I was, might finish this in an hour, I may cut this piece of, actually I might do that now. I'll just get my paper trimmer. This is on the fly. If I cut this to ten and a half centimetres, that will be exactly in half. So it's a little bit smaller than it was. Let me just get my corner rounder because it looks weird because I rounded the corners on the other. And I'm using the four millimeter option. And then I just need that pencil and ruler so I can put my guideline in here. So I could have cut it so it was squarish, but I don't mind it being a bit more of an oblong or rectangle. Works for me. There we are, we should finish this in an hour. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes get myself um, get over enthusiastic about things. So I just need to go somewhere, pick some. There we are, and I'm back. Did what I had to do, <laughs> honestly. Right then, I can't remember what I was wittering about, but, but I know that just by exploring things, drawing in this kind of way, just letting things flow, I will end up with something that will be interesting in its own way. Or maybe just parts of it will warrant a closer look. And that is something I haven't done for a long, long time. But I think it's something that I need to do again. because it came into my mind when I was looking at these um, the other day. And it's easy enough to make a viewfinder. Mm. So I'm going to, I'm just using areas where I can launch lines from. And it's that zent angle, they call it take off and land. Well, I guess it is, but it's just, it's just the way I've always done or created things like this. So this really is, you know, quite comfort art in its way. But it's also very much something that I really enjoy creating. And it's the colour that brings it to life. And once I've added colour, I may then go back and add more textural patterns. Which I used to do with metallic paints, metallic pens, as well as white gel pens. And that then creates this lovely, ooh, that was an interesting wobbly bit, so we'll make them all wobbly. <laughs> Consistency. There we are, <laughs> wobbly edged. Um, because that would actually look quite nice if I remember to do this. So I've put two little blocks here and I'm just going to use that as the space from which I add something else. So I'm going to add this here. And yeah, I didn't quite meet that, but that's what black ink's for, just to fill these little gaps in. And I think I'd like to have some more of these blocks sort of going beside it like this just to give an interesting texture there but also to allow me to perhaps draw some auras here or make it look like I've got some of these kinds of um, leafy things stacked behind. So again, I'm going to do this here and just see what happens. This really is a function of my inner world, how my mind seems to work. Um, when I sit in meditation, use images sometimes well up into my mind 
and they're always things like this that are quite abstract. They're never really um, anything concrete and to do with the world. They can be, but there's also a lot of these kinds of shapes and swirls and patterns. So I think that is the way my mind likes to express itself. So this week has, or this past week has been a bit of a week. I've, yeah, um, I've had um, a busy week in some ways, and in others I've had an awful lot of time where I felt very flat, lacking energy to do anything much of the oomph. Um, oddly, I can always draw, but um, putting words together has been a problem as well. I've tried a number of times to create a video and it just hasn't happened. Or it has, but I realise I've perhaps overshared things or said things that perhaps um, aren't quite appropriate for such a public place. But, you know, perhaps there were things I needed to hear myself say as well. But um, I'm in a bit of a, yeah, flat kind of mood or affect at the moment. It's, I know what's precipitated it, I think, to a degree. I mean, I've had a nightmare time falling over, you know, thin air and hurting and damaging myself, break, things have broken. I still haven't had my washing machine sorted, but I did I did brave a laundrette. And they and it was brilliant. They did a service wash. I took my washing, left it with them after paying. I went back two hours later and it was dry and folded in the bags and it's fantastic. Yet yeah, more expensive than doing washing yourself. I think it cost me £14 for the wash. But wash and dry. But I could, I could just get on with things and somebody else did it so I, I the, when I'm up to having somebody visit my house I will sort the washing machine out but it's quite complex this this adulting thing is not easy for me to do and um, I get easily overwhelmed and I have to be at the right in the right frame of mind at the right time for things to happen and I'm sure that it's the same for many and many people even though we may not like to admit it to others I know it's a function of anxiety and just that that feeling of being overwhelmed by too much to consider and too much to take in and it, it, paraly it can paralyze me and I end up perhaps going into a shop for one thing I'm overwhelmed by the choice that is there and I walk out getting nothing, uh, which is crazy. But I've always been the same. It's part of who I am, I think. And in the same way, I've always experienced anxiety and depression all my life for as long as I can remember. Um, it's normal for me, as in it's all I've known, apart from odd, you know, odd periods of time in life like now when I'm taking antidepressants where my mood is more regulated and you know I don't descend into days weeks and months of crying and nearly breaking my mind which is what happened that gosh 10 years or more ago 10 11 years ago and um A lot better than I was and I caught myself sooner than I would have because I'm aware now of what the signs and symptoms are and the fact that they'd gone on for too long yet again because I wasn't sure whether I was creating a fuss or you know trying to attract draw attention to myself these are demons you know, I say demons but you know voices from the past and um, just you know, I was just so pleased that I was able to talk to somebody who and get my thoughts out about 
approaching uh, my doctor about this, which I did, and they agreed with me, which is a good thing. I think more because I know what it's like and I've been there before. I've been, been in this position before. The, the antidepressants don't stop you from feeling things. And from feeling flat and low and you know, other things. But they just mean I can't descend into that dark place. Quite so easily. Well, hardly ever. And I think it's so important that we talk about things like this because we're all human and an awful lot of people in their lifetime will experience anxiety and depression. And if you don't know what good mental health is, you may not know, like I didn't, that I was experiencing, I'd always experienced poor mental and emotional health because nobody had ever explained to me that how I was thinking, how I was feeling wasn't healthy or, you know, normal in inverted commas. When I was giving talks for Time to Change Wales, which I may step back into at some point, I'm just not ready to at the moment, then I was amazed at how many people would come up to me after my talk um, I tell my story and share information about what mental good health is, about stigma and discrimination and things, and some statistics as well, and saying, thank you so much. I didn't realise that how I'm thinking and feeling isn't how everybody else thinks and feels either, and I can relate to you, and I'm going to go and seek out help now that I know that it's not a good frame, good way to be. And that's the most important thing, is that the help is out there, but unless we talk about what is troubling us, then we may not be able to access that help. Or if we don't talk about what good mental health is or emotional health is, we can't identify when our mental health has plummeted in some ways, or that it's it's causing problems in life. I chose to take medication again because I tried all the techniques I'd used um, in you know that I've learnt through years and years of therapy, and um, it would help momentarily, and then it wouldn't be long before I'd be. Um, dipping back downwards again. So it seemed the most sensible thing for me to do. This is a lovely shape here. I really like this one. This is one I'm going to try and remember to keep. Um, and I know that there are things happening in me, with me in my life that are exacerbating the problem. They're not bad things, don't need to worry, but there, there are changes in the way that I view myself, um, in, in the way, you know, in the line of things to be done, kind of, um, in the waiting room of my life. And that's thrown up a lot of problems as well, the realisation that I need to explore some things about myself. And... Um, also, the sort of like facepalm moment when you realise, how did I not realise this before? But I have now, so that's all that matters. So it, it's a funny time for me. Uh, it's a funny time having to go out and spend time every now and again with people, like I did last night. And that's a part of the reason I'm so tired and exhausted today is it was peopling yesterday. And the peopley people very noisy as well and I was struggling to hear what the person I was talking to was saying before I, I did my, my part in the evening. I was doing a kind of a talk. No, don't ask me about what it is. It's my life. It's personal. 
and um, that was very draining for me just that noise and the press of people and everything that's going on the sudden noises and the um, everything But we get there in the end, so, you know, it's all that matters. And then probably tomorrow I'll feel a bit better, but then I've got a meeting tomorrow night at the Heritage Railway I'm a member of. So I shall be going there, which will be lovely. Um, I volunteered to edit their, um, sort of like, their, their magazine, as it were. The, the members publication which is and it's going to be an annual thing because of how much things can get duplicated online so it's be a sort of retrospective of the running year so this will be the first year I'm doing it and the person who used to do it sadly passed away suddenly last year and um, some reason well this somebody i know there said oh we're stuck for somebody to do it and something just clicked in my head and said well i can help out if you want because i can so they took me up on my offer so that is why i go to these meetings hopefully so i can get the the structure in place and information and you know get introduced to various groups there because it's all changed since I was last a member. This pay this section here really does look very heart shaped and I think I might play on that a little bit. Interesting that's turned up while I'm talking about the railway and other bits and bobs. And if that means there, uh, well, quite nervy because the when I was last a member, I didn't leave exactly in a. I wasn't in a happy place. I was on my rapid descent to um, a serious bout of mental ill health. So um, I've put got a lot of black there, but you know it's going to have to be what it is. These here, I think I'm just going to add that kind of shape on either side, and I do enjoy a border, as you know. So how does that look? It's not too bad. This feels like it's down here is where I need my set of initials to be. And today is the 15th. Of May. Now then, I've got some areas that are quite big, so I am going to add things to these before I do anything else. So that's quite nice the way that cuts that up. That's an interesting shape just there now. Do that. And then with some of these, I would like to fill them in with some simple, perhaps shapes, lines. These are all arranged higgledy-piggledy. I'm trying not to overthink it and just get everything put in there. And perhaps I'll do that on alternate sections here, like so. And then I'll leave those as they are for now. This is a lovely shape here, and I think I'm just going to make it a bit of a feature by drawing inside it. This one here could do with a little shape inside it. This one here is an interesting thing, and I think I could do some 
Perhaps another one of these. And perhaps even a smaller one here. Just add that darkness there. These sections I really would like some bands almost to hold them together, as it were. I think I'll do some on this side, this particular area as well. I'm not trying to get them to line up. This section I'll fill in with um, pattern afterwards, but I think that's as much as I want to do as far as the ink goes. So it's been a wee while. Sometimes it's nice to draw small because I, I find drawing on a larger piece of paper, A4, I don't find overwhelming. But when it comes to adding colour, it overwhelms me hugely. This one should be fine. OK, I am going to use my steampunky collection of colours and I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what they are and I'll try and remember to list them in the box below. I've got red oxide, which is a bit like a red rust colour, rusty red. I've got um, deep indigo, which is a lovely dark blue. I have sepia ink, which is a brown, brown grey or a grey brown colour, dark colour. Payne's grey, which is a bluey grey. Um, I've got iron green and I also have iron blue, which are, as they say, they're the colours I associate with green, uh, with iron that's corroding. When you look at the rust and the corrosion there, you can see these colours in it. I've got baked earth, which is a nice sort of like lighter, warm, orangey, reddy brown. Mustard, which is that lovely yellowy colour. I've got madder brown. I don't know what it's madder than, but it's madder brown. And this is sort of like lovely purpley red brown. And I've got mid vermilion, which is kind of an orangey, pinky colour. It's, it's, they, they seem to work together. And... I'll bring this back in because you can see the kinds of colours I've got here. Because I think I'd like to use these kinds. Do you know that sepia ink and indigo is absolutely gorgeous. Who, oh, no, sepia ink and iron green because the colours I've written underneath. That is really lovely. I'm going to use some of that now. Yes, we are. Right, there's the sepia. And here is the iron green. And I've got... To complete my set of tools, I've got this. It's a Kuretake Zig water brush. This is a fine one. Um, you can sometimes buy them individually, but often they come in packs of three and I don't use the bigger, bigger sizes. And I've got my two um, colours. I've got sepia ink and iron green, the Duwend Ink Tents. And I've just got here, it's a piece of bamboo cloth, like dish cloth. Um, or, you know, instead of paper towels, is I just use it to wipe the colour off. Now, the fun thing is that with this, all of these colours with ink tents will be permanent on here. They'll never wash out. So isn't that great? So I want to look where I, I can add some of this colour. And I think I'm going to go here. So I am going to add sepia in the darker nooks and crannies. Now, do I feel this? I do feel this is bending back in back away from us here. So I'm going to add some darker colour at the bottom. Not so much on this side because it's not so big a, piece, big a section. And then I'm going to add the iron green and I'm going to overlap it with the sepia to a degree. And I'm going to leave a section in the middle where perhaps there's not any colour or not so much colour because I'll want to fade the green out. If I don't do that, we'll end up with quite a dark colour all the way through. But if I need more colour, if I, you know, if it doesn't suit me how I've done it, then I can always go back and add more colour. Ink tents pencils are fantastic. They um they dry permanent, so you don't have to worry about shifting colour around if you want to add more. Once they dry, you can add more colour and move them around. Bearing in mind that some of the pigment here may not activate with the water. 
as it does get stuck into the nooks and crannies of the, the paper. And I don't want to overwork this paper because it's not watercolour paper. But it actually takes a fair amount of water and, you know, back and forth here. And every now and again, I'll just wipe the colour off my brush so that I can reduce the, the, the intensity of the colour on it. Now that sepia there made a little hole there of colour, but what I'll do is I'll just dab extra bits of colour on until I get it looking the way I'd like it. I'm going to pull some of that sepia down into the green and then I'm going to start by activating this green. I'm going to move it down into the sepia, activating that sepia so I get that lovely dark colour. And then I can just smooth that out a bit. It's not going to be perfect. And if I think I need any highlight on this, I can do that with white gel pen or white ink or, um, you know, sort of like anything that will add some highlight there. So I'll do the same on here. And this is just done with two colours. I think if I tried to put more than two colours in such a small space, they'd all blend into the same same kind of colour. I don't want to do that. I am taking some of this sepia down into the green though, so that it becomes a slightly greyer, browner green. Then it's naturally pure colour. You know, the colour it is new on its own. So I'm going for that kind of metallic-y, industrially grungy, corroded kind of look here, vintage look. That actually works, and I've got a section here that I want to do the same with. I didn't spot that one, but I have now. So this may be my main way of adding colour to this, or the main colours I'm going to use. Don't know may change but this is I'm really impressed with how lovely this has worked out and like any water-based media that you use um, the colors do fade as they dry so if they look really intense when the water is wet water is wet yeah when the colors wet but as it dries it does fade somewhat But that's true of all water soluble media and of course the ink tense pencils show their vibrancy of colour once you do add water to them. Don't know if you noticed how much the colour showed up then. So I've got that going on there which is really, that looks quite nice. I like that. Okie dokes. I do want to, that's dry at the bottom, I do want to put some golden colour in these narrow areas or goldenish so I'm not using a bright gold I'm using this mustard which is it's, it's sort of like it is a yellow but it's it's almost got a hint of green in it but with this I'm also going to add some red oxide because I know this will make a nice mix of colours they will fade nicely one into the other and red and green are kind of complementary colours they sort of like they, they can vibrate a bit again. Well, they vibrate against each other. They look brighter against each other. So that'd be nice. Again, it's just a case of I'm going to blend into the red, red into that mustard, move the mustard up, and then into that red again, and just blend it back a little bit, and that'll be lovely. Same this side. And then just this last one. It looks like old brass or, you know, um, 
some kind of yellowish metal that's starting to corrode or has got dirty and so on and aged. So that works quite nicely. Do you know what you think? Now in these sections here I want to do something a bit different so I'm going to go back to my colour combinations here. So that's the one I've used, the sepia ink and iron green. And I'm looking at what could I use for these sections that I would like. Because so they're only little so I don't want anything that's too big. I might use I think I might use iron blue on its own because I do like I do like iron blue it's not as I'm not going to do every section with iron blue but what I'm going to do is every other section I'm going to add iron blue at the edges and then I'm going to fade it out to the middle so it's I'm just using one color in these sections for this but fading towards the middle will give us that highlight so let me give stagger these a bit perhaps. Well, the other thing about ink tense pencils is they're called ink tense because the colours really are intense. A little bit gives you an awful lot of colour and with them because you can add a little bit and decide that actually that was too too little I can always go you can always add more once it's dried. And I say once it's dried, because if you start adding colour onto wet paper, the colour will stick and you can end up with a bit of a mess. That's my experience because I'm not exactly the best at using traditional media. This is how I do it. It may not be the way other people do it or the way other people like to do it. This is how it works for me. How I express colour my way, I suppose. That does give me a subtle highlight in the centre there, which of course again I can work on by either adding highlight or adding some, some textural patterns to this to bring out the darker areas. And I'm trying to go back and make the darker areas dark as I can on this now. This is where wiping the colour off in between the light and dark sections helps to get that soft gradient and stops the colours becoming all the same. So that, that works. Now I'm not quite sure, I think, I think, I think, I think I'm going to use the mustard in between them. Because yellow and blue are complementary colours. And so these will look rather dashing together I think. Again I'm just using the mustard on its own, I'm not adding any other colour with it. These, these little sections are very tiny. If I do want to add colour once it's dried or a little a hint of, I don't know, um, the vermilion or baked earth to the edges here or something, or use different medium to add a slight to increase the contrast then that's always possible but I'm going to let these dry with not taking long because I'm not using a lot of water although there's plenty flooding out of my brush there I prefer a water brush to a brush and a pot of water because I don't have to keep rattling my brush around the water and dabbing the water off trying to judge when the the brush is the right, um, has got the right amount of water on it and so on. With these, that you can sort of get get used to how, how hard you squeeze it to get water to, down into the reservoir here. And that then will control how much water flows out of here. Sometimes it's a bit too much, so I just work it until it just fades away a bit. So that's quite interesting. It's quite cold looking but I'm fine with that. This is the mid vermilion and I'm going to put that in the centre here like so. Quite a lot of it but I'm just going to check on this. Have I got, got 
red oxidant. You can see here the red oxide and the mid vermilion here actually fade quite nicely one into the other but I think I want something a little bit darker than the red oxide so I am going to go with where is it the madder brown and I'm just going to put the tiniest bit right in the corner of this shape now this is going to be a challenge because I'm going to want to work into the madder brown and just allow that to spread very softly and gently into the vermilion. So I'm activating the vermilion and then pulling some of that colour into the madder brown and then just allowing it to flow and spread naturally into what water is or what liquid is there and seeing how we end up with that and try and keep a highlight in the middle. I'm not going to work in that section now because um, because it's very wet and I quite like the texture I'm getting there as it's drying. That's really quite nice. This is the iron green. I'm going to use that here because this does look like um, some kind of leafy frond. I'm going to add mustard to it so I get a lighter green at the end of this leaf. Perhaps a more yellowy green as well. And it does work. I've used this already in some artwork. So that actually works quite nicely and I think I'm going to try and do something a bit similar to what I've just done with the this section here where I've dropped little bits of colour or water in and we've got some interesting texture going on there where it blooms out and dries with an edge to it. That's, that's created something that's quite interesting. So I'm learning skills here. I am. Okay, so this section here, I think I may go with that mid vermilion again. Just checking I picked up the mid vermilion and some madder brown. I think the colour comes from a plant called madder. Originally the name of it. I could be wrong, but I seem to remember. I know there's a plant called the madder plant. It doesn't mean it's crazy. It's just its name. I don't know why. I'd have to look it up. Why is the madder called the madder? So this I think will be my last little section here for now and I'm going to say if you want to see more of this or I'll, what actually what I'll do is I will finish this add on the extra little bits and bobs and um, just see whether we can get anything to go here that will Uh, uh, oh gosh, so we've got a reference to draw from and if you want to see any more information about how I do things then you'll have to let me know. But I think it's a good start and things like this are fun to add colour to. I could just do black and white texture and shading but I quite like the idea of, oh, excuse me, working with colour. So for now, I'm going to say thank you for joining me, for listening to me witter and ramble on about stuff I can't remember wittering and rambling on about. Um, I hope you give, draw give drawing along with me a try. Or just sit down and just let your hand move in the way it wants to and see what comes and how things connect, you know, connect together. Um, I like swirls and lines like this. It reminds me very much of psychedelic art, the 60s and 70s. Um, it, I think there's a big influence from such imagery with me and the, 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 the abstract nature of patterns. There is something about that I really love. Um, 
and find the interesting bit in something. And we'll use that as the, or used to use that as a basis for a drawing. And I think it's something I'd like to explore again, as well as, you know, things like this, using it as a starting point. Um, but anyway, I'm wittering on again. So please look after yourselves, take care. And above all else, find time to be creative. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Fingers crossed my energy get picks up this week. So, ta-ta for now. Bye.